Bonjour, I'm Ben Wattenberg and I'm cold in Quebec City. Because they want to preserve their unique French heritage and culture, many Quebecers want to secede from Canada. In 1995, they almost did. Next time, they may win. Canada splitting up? Could it happen? Could it lead to violence? What would it mean for Canada and the United States? This week on Think Tank. The seven million residents in the Canadian province of Quebec make up almost a quarter of the population of the entire country. Its economy is responsible for one-fifth of Canada's total gross domestic product. Quebec's landmass is bigger than the state of Alaska and it divides Canada's ten provinces. To its east are the four maritime provinces along the Atlantic Ocean and to the west, Ontario and the Prairie and Pacific provinces of Canada. Despite its relatively central location, things in Quebec sound... ...and look differently than in the other nine Canadian provinces. There is a culture here that is distinct on the North American continent. Originally a French colony, 82% of Quebecers speak French as their first language. Still, many Quebecois worry about the future of their culture and language and whether it can continue to flourish. Many here think Quebec would be better off if they were in business for themselves with their own nation, independent from the rest of Canada. They make up a major movement for Quebec sovereignty. Think Tank recently traveled to Quebec City, the capital of Quebec province and the heart of the sovereignty movement. We were there during the city's annual Winter Carnival, a celebration of Quebec culture and a way to help locals get through the long, harsh winters. And while the carnival carried on outside, Primarily, inside been some been of the world's leading political scientists so gathered to discuss how national disintegration affects the world order. They discussed both violent and nonviolent fragmentation from the recent peaceful split up of Slovakia and the Czech Republic to the brutal and Western bloody situations in Ireland, Rwanda, and the Middle East. And of course, they were paying special attention to the situation in Quebec. For one distinguished participant in the conference, talk of disintegration brought back a painful chapter in American history. I don't think that it means war here. I wouldn't carry the analogy of the U.S. to Quebec, Canada as far as that, but I do think some things are comparable because one part of the nation wants to be treated specially. And I don't think a constitution can last under the circumstances where constitutionally you recognize a difference. You might have a difference in practice, but the constitution itself has to be universal in the way it treats, the way it makes processes available, and the way it makes rights available. To understand the current situation in Canada, Let's look at some history. The history of French culture in Quebec goes back to the colony of New France, claimed for France in 1534 by the explorer Jacques Cartier. Quebec remained a French possession until 1759, when the British army defeated the French here at Quebec City. The key episode took place in 1759, when the French had to concentrate all the forces they had at Quebec and the British uh, had brought a great expeditionary force there to try and take it. it was, it's a terrifically tough nut. Anybody who goes to the old city of Quebec and looks up at this castle on the heights will see what a wonderful position it is. But in the end, the British managed to find a way round, slip under the guns, get up behind the fort, get up onto the plains of Abraham, and tempt the French out to fight a battle. The Battle of the Plains of Abraham, which results in the death of Wolfe, the death of Montcalm, the two conflicting generals, and the death of French Canada. And while the battle may have ended French rule in Canada, the French culture, language, and national identity survived 
and flourished. Canada was granted independence from England in 1867 with a powerful French-speaking minority in place. In the 1960s, French-Canadian discontent with the Canadian-English-speaking majority grew. Yes, in the 1960s, there was economic discrepancies, um, inequalities, very strong inequalities. The Anglophone community uh, was controlling business, education, the decision-making process. These painful perceptions contributed to a growing nationalist movement in Quebec, a movement that sought independence from Canada. French President Charles de Gaulle helped legitimize this movement when, during a visit to Montreal in 1967, he boomed out, Vive le Québec Libre! This boosted sovereignist passion and led to the formation of the Parti Québécois, a separatist political party. In 1970, following a wave of separatist terrorism, the Canadian federal government adopted the War Measures Act and sent troops to Quebec to discourage violence. The violent extremists, however, did not hurt the growing popular sentiment for sovereignty. In 1980, following the Parti Québécois rise to power in the previous decade, a national referendum on Quebec sovereignty was held in the province. Forty percent of Quebecers voted to secede and the sovereignists sure. vowed not to give up. Sure. In 1982, the Canadian government revised their constitution, but without getting Quebec's formal approval. Sovereignists rejected the new constitution because they thought it reduced their ability to govern themselves on matters such as language and education. The second referendum in 1995 was much closer, catching the world and many Canadians by surprise. The sovereignists lost by an extremely slim margin, 50.6% to 49.4% and with 94% of eligible voters turning out. Many called the close vote a moral victory for the sovereignists and served notice to Canada and the world that a third referendum would be held soon. Since the referendum of 1995, the issue of secession has split Quebec and dominated conversation throughout Canada. Bernard Landry is the deputy premier of Quebec and a leader of the Parti Québécois. We want an independent Quebec because Quebecers are a nation, a people, a peuple, like we say uh, in, in French by every characteristic uh, in the classical books, if I may say, uh, Weber, uh, Renan, and all the others, uh, you, a group of human beings with common will, common history, uh, common happiness, uh, common catastrophes, and, and strong will to live together, which is the characteristic of a nation. But not all Quebecers agree. Others think the sovereignists' grievances are hollow, and Quebec can keep its unique identity while remaining in Canada. Max and Monique Nemney are the publishers of the journal Cité Libre, dedicated to defending Canadian unity. What they really want is all of the advantages of Canada plus the advantages of a new imaginary country called Quebec. They want their cake and eat it too. Well, listen, people, I mean, what else do you want? You have your own schools in French. You have people going to Parliament. We, you even elected people that became the official opposition in Parliament, a party that wants to destroy Canada. Like many of their fellow residents in Montreal, the Nemnies worry that a Quebec secession could lead to further fragmentation. When, when you take Quebec out of Canada, that is it. There is no more Canada. What there will be after that, no one knows. But as far as I'm concerned, it is impossible to believe that a Canada will exist if Quebec secedes. And many Canadians wonder, if Quebec were to secede, what would happen to Canada? John Trent, an organizer of the conference, teaches at the University so of Ottawa. People would say to themselves, look, uh, I've got real problems. I've got a family to feed. I need economic uh, security. I need political security. Where can I get that quickest? But more than that, at the same time, the, the will 
towards Canadian unity, which is a will based on a multi-ethnic, multinational country, a pluralist country, that will would have been ruptured and the relationships that had been based on it would be ruptured. So I think, personally, that it would be more likely for Canadians looking for a solution in a hurry to say to themselves, yeah, I speak English, uh, the Americans speak English. Uh, I want economic stability, the Americans are even wealthier than we are. And so why not look towards our American cousins more easily and quickly than, uh, than I would uh, going with those guys who've just thrown us overboard. Stéphane Dion is Canada's Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. He is the federal government's point man on the Quebec issue. He is also a Quebecer. I think for me to be in the same country than a person of Winnipeg or Vancouver that, or Toronto that doesn't speak my language very clearly but wants to help me and to compliment me and to accept my help this is great. It helps me and my children to become better citizens. And it's helped them to become better citizens, to have me, myself and my family and my friends part of their country. This is the Canadian dream that we will keep united. Be sure of that. But under what conditions would the federal government under Jean Chrétien accept Quebec independence? What we need is first, in Quebec, a very clear question crystal clear about separation, with nothing confusing in the question, a clear majority that we will have to clarify in the future, what means a clear majority, but it cannot be 50% plus one for something so important. And uh, finally, a negotiation of the secession that would be very painful and difficult, a negotiation of the secession done within the legal framework according to the law of the land, the Constitution of Canada. And earlier this year, the Canadian Supreme Court held hearings on the constitutionality of Quebec secession. We will never accept that unilaterally the federal government said, those are the conditions and you do this or you cannot be independent because it will be renounced to what a nation is, essentially a three group of human beings. Though Canada has little history of civil violence, not all are sure that a Quebec secession would be bloodless. There is a possibility of violence. Uh, and uh, whether or not there's going to be violence, I don't know. But uh, <coughs> the history of mankind, I believe, shows you that there has never been a situation in which you carve up a given territory, a given political institution that is in operation and that you don't get violence. People should remain calm whatever happened in any situation and we should use the means to a democratic uh, resolution of, of, uh, of problems and I think that's the only and it's the best way to resolve problems. And while Canadians wait for the Supreme Court's decision and the sovereigntists next move, folks here wonder whether there will be bumps ahead. It was here on the Plains of Abraham that the English army led by General Wolfe defeated the French forces in September of 1759. Today it is the location of the Museum of Quebec. Think Tank recently went to the museum to discuss the issue of Quebec sovereignty. Joining Think Tank for the discussion were Guy Laforet, professor of political science at Laval University and co-author of Beyond the Impasse, Roger Gibbons, professor of political science at the University of Calgary and also a co-author of Beyond the Impasse, and Monique Jérôme Forget, president of the Institute for Research on Public Policy Studies in Montreal. Uh, lady and gentlemen, thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, I, I wanted to begin by asking you to present to your friends south of the border uh, what this argument about Quebec separatism is really about. And Guy, you come basically from a separatist community. Maybe you could begin by just telling us what would the more intense members of the uh, the Quebec community feel about this issue and why? Well, they want self-rule. Uh, they, they want to act as a national community. 
uh, they want, they think that their national government is in Quebec City. They see that their GDP is the side of Belgium and Austria. They have an international city in Montreal. They have a, a, a dominant language, which is French, which is one of the major languages of the modern world. They have a vibrant culture. Uh, they're, they're making things in science. They make realizations in all major aspects of the modern life. Uh, they want to be recognized internationally, so they want, uh, they want power, they want uh, freedom, and they want uh, recognition. So the basic drive, I would say, is for a combination of these things. And they think, they think that uh, they have the tools uh, required to be uh, a player out there in, uh, in the international world. What, what's your problem with that? What, what, what would the most intense of, of, of your colleagues say? You come from mid-continent, from Calgary. What, what, what's, what's your problem with that? Well, there are two ways of looking at it. One is to point out the obvious, and that is that Quebec sits in the middle of the Canadian landmass, and therefore the, an independent Quebec, a fully independent Quebec, destroys, potentially destroys, the integrity of Canada. You know, Canadian nationalism sees a country that reaches from sea to sea, but Quebec is not only a quarter of the population, but a very substantial part of the geography. But it, it, goes, it goes beyond that, or it's, and my part of the country, the western part of the country, has a, a view of politics that is probably more similar to that shared by many American viewers. The, the west was settled late, and therefore the rich history of Quebec, the rich history of, western, of central Canada, is more or less irrelevant to people in the west. They weren't there, the west wasn't, wasn't settled. And also, although francophones make up a quarter of the Canadian population, in my part of the country, they make up two, three percent of the population. So we live in an environment that is exclusively Anglophone, has a very American culture in the, in the emphasis on individual rights, the equality of, of, of individual people, not collectivities. What, what do most of your uh, folks say about the Quebecers? Do they say if they want to go, let them go? Or do they say, well, they got to behave exactly the way everybody else does and they can, you, you know, uh, that's it, period. Or, or are they ready for some new accommodation? Very complex question. Lately, and this is something that Guy and I have been very concerned about, the, the, the tone, the, the temper of, of discourse has gotten rather nasty, rather, rather angry. So there are more people. It sounds now. like the United States. <laughs> well, it, 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 yes, in, in many respects, right. the, the civility, the, the good humor is is going, and so people are more inclined to say, "Yeah, let them go." But that's that's not the majority sentiment because the cost would simply be too high to Canada. Uh, you run the Institute for Research on Public Policy in Montreal, which That's is a correct. national think tank. It's a national think tank. So in, in theory, your views uh, would blend a little bit of these two views? Uh, well, we do a lot of different kind of research, but on that issue, uh, we felt uh, that uh, it was our role, being located in Montreal and being a national think tank, to try to find a way that we could explain bo to both sides what is going on and what are the trade-offs. What is it that uh, needs to be done so that perhaps we can find a long-term solution? In fact, we actually <coughs> had a great impact on the, on the outcome of the uh, studies. It's that how do we bring closure to this debate? Uh, this is not a new debate. It, remember, uh, it started a long, long time ago. The uh, Quebecers fought to have uh, bilingual stamps. Uh, they fought to have bilingual money. They fought to have uh, uh, a number of institutions where they would be present. So uh, it's been a stepwise approach. And the fact that we have a government, uh, federalism itself uh, allows uh, a greater presence of it isn't isn't the idea of, of closure in this sort of an issue a little bit naive I mean you see these sorts of arguments be it in Israel Palestine or Northern Ireland or uh, Corsica or you can go around the world there must be several scores of, yeah. of somewhat similar situations and Bureaucrats always come and say, oh, well, we're, we can really split the difference, and of course the, the animosity remains. We're not Ulster. Uh, this is not Northern Ireland. However, 
the language of demonization of, of, say, for instance, portraying the Premier of Quebec, Lucien Bouchard, the way Parnell, the Irish leader, was portrayed by the British press at the time of Gladstone's home rule bills in the 19th century, vilifying him uh, and that kind of stuff. Read, uh, read the Financial Post, for instance, uh, read, uh, uh, read the Montreal Gazette these days, and you see the same kind of uh, uh, satanizing, vilifying uh, uh, things that, lead, that can lead to, uh, to unpleasant affairs. The minute you talk about any kind of nationalism, you're playing with fire. Mm -hmm. uh, because you end up dealing with extremes on both sides. Uh, Guy talks about extremes on, on the partitionist group, those in Montreal who will say, we'll say with Canada at any cost, any cost. And you have on the sovereignist side, the other group that says, well, we'll have nothing to do with Canada at any cost. And we'll get there no matter how long it takes. Uh, so you have those two groups, but in the middle, as Roger was pointing out, I guess people want to make sense out of that. Deep down, people want to uh, get along, they want to find, to reconcile. I don't see secession or separation or sovereignty occurring the next couple of years for Quebec. That's, that's not what I see in uh, my ball. Um, Status quo, uh, our, one of our colleagues, David Cameron, said we always uh, underestimate the staying power of the status quo. Uh, so the status quo, as political scientists, I think one of our mistakes, we've neglected uh, its staying power. Problem for us, and that's the reason why we're, we're getting pessimistic, is that the, the status quo is, uh, is uh, we're paying a price for the, 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 the structural weaknesses of our, uh, of our political system. Roger has a nice expression. As, as a, in so far as our resources, our people, what Canada is as, our, as a country, um, we're much better than our political institutions. We deserve better institutions uh, as, a, as a people, uh, as, uh, as a community, than we have. Uh, we, we challenge our leadership in our project. We're telling them, be daring. Now is the time to, to reinvent something for us to be uh, to be uh, to be strong in uh, in north in the northern part of uh, of America uh, and and Quebecers in that context I mean Quebecers are uh, are world oriented and they learn Spanish uh, they they travel in Europe they they go all over the place so Quebecers uh, uh, I, I would say that, that the majority of them want to deal with Canada they want partnership with Canada they'd like to be both they'd like to be Quebecers and Canadians no, but, and but they have dreams for the 21st century. But 49 and a half percent of them a couple of years ago said uh, that's a nice speech Guy but no thank you. But they, 49 and a half yeah. it doesn't take much <laughs> more true. to get to. You <laughs> no know, it didn't and, and, and with reason with reason because consent is one of the major pillars of liberal democracy and we did not consent to that major reform of Canadian institutions in the 20th century. Uh, look, uh, we are running out of time now. Let me ask one question, go around the room, one, two, three, quickly, and it is this. Let us turn the clock forward to the year 2010, and let me ask you for a brief answer, what will the political situation in Canada look like in 2010? I think we'll, we'll have something that looks a lot like the status quo and will be a weaker, poorer country as a consequence. I think we will have uh, solved our problem in Canada and we will have find some kind of peaceful solution. I'm very pessimistic. I think that uh, things are, have gone sour. Uh, 2010, uh, I'll be 55 and, uh, uh, and I hope I, I don't have to go working in Barcelona or some other place. But you know, the, the, optimistic, the optimistic side of me said that we also underestimate the the, the life instinct of, uh, of a people, of a political community. And uh, I think that on the whole, uh, the, the strength of Canada and Quebec beyond the institution is that this, these are well-educated populations. My optimistic side is that their, their life instincts will prevail. Thank you, Guy and Monique and Roger. And thank you uh, very much for joining us. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. We at Think Tank depend on your views to make our show better. Please send your questions and comments to New River Media, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C. 20036. Or email us at 
Think Tank at pbs.org. To learn more about Think Tank, visit PBS online at www.pbs.org. And please let us know where you watch Think Tank. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.